Introduction to Policing, uh, Chapter 3. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a video lecture for Chapter 3. Uh, this lecture is about the nature of a police organization and police administration. Now, I hope you had a chance to review the previous chapter. I also hope that you had the opportunity to review uh, the chapter for this week's assignments. Uh, this is not a substitute uh, to reading the chapter. So, if you have not done so, uh, please review the chapter before you engage this video lecture. Now, assuming that you have read the chapter, let's delve into this uh, video lecture. Uh, learning objectives. Uh, our learning objectives for this chapter include the following. Uh, you should be able to explain the importance of organizational structures in police departments, uh, being able to list uh, the duties that are typically associated with uh, uh, the operation of a particular police department, in particular the operations uh, division. You should be able to describe the influence of organizational sub subcultures, uh, such as geography and scheduling, um, on the nature, at least on the operations of police departments. You should also be able to explain a few strategies that uh, police organizations uh, can use as a way to sort of navigate changes favorably. You should be able to sort of uh, evaluate the extent to which police departments have become militarized and the implications of, 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 of this militarization. And you should be able to sort of uh, identify the pros and cons of collective bargaining in police organizations. And finally, you should be able to describe the advantages of accreditation in the field of policing in general. Introduction. Uh, police agencies are dynamic. And because of their dynamic nature, police organizations must operate effectively and efficiently. But it encumbers on police administrators to sort of coordinate and direct their organization. These administrators must be able to work uh, in a way that they're able to manage the personnel. They must evaluate reports. They must also work on budgeting. Organizational structures. When we're talking about organizations in policing, What's important to understand is that police are organizations by nature. Um, police entities operate within the confine of a particular structure. Now, the question becomes, what is an organization? How to best describe uh, organization within, at least in the context of policing? The police are organizations in terms of they could be understood as a rational uh, or efficient form of grouping people. It is also important to note that there may be single person departments. So in this case, I'm referring to chief of police who performs all functions within a particular police department. But there are also what is known as a multi-person police department. And what that means is that we're talking about a police department that, that, that has several individuals. The largest police departments tend to have a wide variety of functions or entities within their organizational structures. Uh, some departments may have four to five rank levels. Others may have 10 to 12 different ranks. Keep in mind that some departments have one headquarters and other departments have uh, many offices which are scattered across a town or a particular city. Police hierarchy. Uh, most police organizations are hierarchies. Uh, they resemble pyramid-like staff structures. So in this case, the base of the police hierarchy consists of those who do actual police work within the organizations. And these individuals include patrol officers and investigators. Uh, hierarchy within a police, within a police setting or a police structure, uh, 
is, is a way to indicate the responsibility or the type of responsibility of those who occupy a particular rank, of the person who occupies a particular rank. So the amount of police work a person performs is usually inversely related to his or her uh, position within the organization itself. But it is important to note that there are three, uh, uh, I would say, vital characteristics within the within a hierarchical structure of police. They include the unity of command, the rank structure, and the span of control. A unity of command uh, means that every member of the police organization reports to an immediate superior. For example, patrol officers in the police agency are responsible to the field supervisor, and that person is usually a sergeant. Uh, the field supervisor himself is responsible to the chief administrator, and that individual is usually a lieutenant. Uh, and the chief administrator is responsible for the uh, uh, responsible to the division uh, of commander or division commander, and so on. Uh, the pyramid goes on. When it comes to rank structure or the concept commonly known as chain of command, the idea is to identify those who communicate with and have a sense of who gives orders to whom. Um, that structure uh, clearly and precisely identifies the line of authority within the police department within the department. Um, now, it is important to note that the line of command, at least the chain of command or the rank structure, varies uh, depending on the size of the police department. This usually involves multiple hierarchies, such as an authority hierarchy and a status hierarchy. A police commander with 15 years of experience holds a higher rank in the department, whereas a shift sergeant doesn't have the same level of hierarchy, even if that sergeant might have 25 years of, of experience within the police department. Now, it is also important to note that in this seniority hierarchy, the sergeant, in this case, occupies a higher position in relation to the police commander. Now, the concept of span of control is a way to sort of evaluate the ratio of supervisors to subordinates. And what that means is that the spin of control differs from one rank layer in the hierarchy to the next. The ratio of supervisors to the police officers is usually smaller near to the top of the department. In other words, the higher you go in the pyramid, the smaller the ratio of supervisors until you get to the chief, which is usually one entity who is in charge. And it is a top to bottom approach. Hierarchy in communication. Uh, and the concept of hierarchy and communication, hierarchy sort of divides authority, right? So when you have a hierarchy within the police, you have a certain individuals that are placed within a certain uh, function, within a certain rank, which is a certain level, and that level is usually a symbol of their authority, right? So that ensures a clear responsibility and accountability for specific tasks that may, that must be done. It is also a way to to clarify supervisor's span of control. Remember, when we're talking about span of control, we're talking about the ratio between supervisors and subordinates. Hierarchies tend to suffer uh, from a variety of communication problems. For example, because it is a top uh, to the bottom approach or top down approach, uh, the communication is sort of one way. It flows from the top all the way to the bottom. So sometimes when there are problems at the bottom, so the, the top will not know about it unless somebody at the bottom finds a way to communicate that information to the top. And those are some of the criticisms that, that people often levy against this approach. But it is a one-way flow of information. And as a result of that, there's a lack of feedback from the people that are at the bottom of the hierarchy. It is also important to understand that there are fewer opportunities as well. Because again, because you know those that are at the bottom of the pyramid do not have the clout the, the the leeway to voice concerns or to raise concerns to the people that are at the top level. So understandably, there are fewer opportunities to provide feedback on organization, organizational policies or on, on procedures.
Uh, there's also the concept known as Incident Command System, which is also known as ICS. And the goal of this entity is to overcome communication problems. So many agencies have sort of developed this approach, and it is a way sort of to use as an emergency. So you can bypass a certain level of authority if you could go directly to the Incident Command System to voice a certain concerns, uh, you know, to share certain information that you may deem necessary, but you would not otherwise be able to transmit within the, within the normal chain of command. So an ICS coordinates uh, police personnel. Uh, it allocates resources. It allows emergency responders to adopt and integrate organization structure, right? It is an attempt to achieve effective coordination of police personnel. It is a way as well to sort of ensure appropriate allocation of resources, and it is a way to provide responders sort of the capacity to do their job even within jurisdictional boundaries. Another reality within the police, at least within, within police entities, is the concept known as paramil paramilitary structure. Uh, in the paramilitary structure, what we see is that, you know, the police is sort of uh, structured in a rigid uh, way or military style way. Now, this approach evolved uh, during the professional era, which is, which dates from the 1950s and all the way to the, to the 1980s. Uh, during that time, uh, police administrators wanted to sort of create a distance between the public and the police, and it was a way sort of to slow down corruption and all sorts of illicit or illegal practices or unquestionable ethical, unethical practices uh, that police officers tended to sort of venture when they were too close uh, too close to the public. So it was a way to achieve, at least to increase a certain level of, of efficiency and, and policing, because if the police entities, at least police officers, were uh, required to function within a rigid military-like structure, then the light then the likelihood that they would engage in, mis in certain behaviors would sort of reduce dras drastically. At least that was the idea. It is worth noting that a paramilitary structure uh, resembles a military in many ways. Uh, one of the key ways to see that is that it resembles the military in its centralized police control. Uh, the, the, the police itself, everything about the police is based on one particular entity. For example, it might be the chief, and the chief does not share uh, its command, its direction, its administration of the police. It is centralized in a particular way, and it's usually the whole power centers in the hands of one individual or one particular group of people. It, it is similar to the military in its rigid structure. Uh, it's focuses on accountability. Um, it uh, sort of has a clear uh, supervision structure. It focuses on law enforcement. It also focuses on fighting crime rather than attempting to solving, uh, you know, the issues that are sort of rampant in the community, um, they sort of don't address citizen problems. Citizen problems. All they do is they focus on crime. Uh, it's just the military structure. That's what, that's what it, it, it facilitates. Uh, the paramilitary structure was designed to improve efficiency for emergencies and investigations. And the idea is to ensure that there is a fair and impartial enforcement of the law. So it's just to remove some of the discretions that police officers tend to have. So in this military structure, there are certain ways that you, the police officer is expected to do his job. And this is one, two, three, or A, B, C. So you have to follow those rules that are pre-established ahead of time where you have less discretion, less subjectivity, at least that's the idea. So the paramilitary structure sort of removes the officer in the decision making, in the equation, so to speak. Right. So a paramilitary structure focused on rigidity and accountability. Right. But the problem with this approach is that it can handle communication because it's it's just it's so rigid. It is so from from top to bottom. So there's no way for entities to communicate within between amongst themselves at least horizontally. Uh, it's always from the top to the bottom. So it's one of the downside of of, of downsides of the paramilitary structure. Another downside is that it may it, it, it discourages. It does not sort of facilitate employee. Uh, uh, participation, right? So employee commitment can be affected because they don't have a lot of discretion. Um, they, they, they're not encouraged to do critical thinking. So, you know, 
employees may feel like or police officer may feel like uh, you know the job itself is not worth it because they they just don't find it full, fulfilling because they're not really a part it's, they're, they're functioning as robots the flexibility of the paramilitary structure can slow change as well Administrators who seek change within the organization may find it hard because there are certain layers, there are certain ways to uh, to go about making changes. So sometimes police administrators and, and, and administrators within a rigid military structure try to make changes via informal channels, informal uh, ways to do so. But police agencies are increasingly finding out that the military structure, or at least the paramilitary structure, is not best approach so they can see uh, its limitations so some of those limitations as as i uh, alluded earlier include restriction on personal freedom uh, individual freedom uh, poor communication lack of flexibility uh, it, it encourages a narrowness of job of job descriptions right uh, so this approach may also have an impact on community relations for it may hinder uh, the relationship that the police organization has with the community that they, they serve. So despite uh, several, I would say, uh, similarities between the, uh, you know, the, the military and the police in terms of the rank structure, uh, uniform sometimes, the function of the police as opposed to the military is different. Those are two different entities. They have different functionalities, different purposes. So when you have a police that is heavily militarized, this is not a good thing for policing in general. One of the most important facets of policing is that police officers must be able to uh, to take initiatives. They must be able to sort of have, have discretion. So those are important because every situation is different and you cannot expect that every police officer is going to do the same thing at the same time. So it encourages police officers to sort of overlook rules that are established. Uh, it forces them to sort of try to do things their way and also hide. Uh, the way they operate. So police officers would be less likely to report incidents if the incident didn't fall within the expected parameters set forth by the organization. So those are the downsides of a paramilitary approach to policing. Police militarization. As we've talked about earlier, the separation between the police and the military is important because it is a fundamental element for democracy, right? So during the Reconstruction era and after the Civil War, uh, the idea that there was a need to sort of separate the federal government uh, with local government, right? So the enactment of the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, which was updated uh, in 1956, and in 1981 was sort of intended to limit the federal government's power and using the military personnel for domestic law enforcement. So it, it was sort of clear that there ought to be a wedge between the military and the police, and the military should not be involved in law enforcement. For all the reasons we've described either in class discussions and in, in, in the chapters. It's, it's like those are two different ways of doing, uh, it's a two different ways of being in terms of uh, doing functioning. So it, it, the police and the military should never be sort of intertwined when it comes to law enforcement. But that doesn't mean that the, the military has not has an important role in policing. Uh, one of the ways uh, police are militarized is via what we know as specialized unit. And one of the most, I would say the most prominent specialized unit within the police is the SWAT team. Uh, SWAT, which is known as the special weapon and tactics teams. Uh, so their goal usually is to sort of go and, and deal with individuals who who have military style uh, weaponry uh, that the police cannot deal with those le that level of expertise. So the SWAT teams are usually individuals that are well trained, well equipped with military style equipment, of course, to deal with individuals that cause a problem for them. So, so approximately 500 agencies across the United States have SWAT teams, right? Now, it is important to note that the SWAT team uh, uh, evolved over the years. It was it was originally something that uh, started in Los Angeles in 1966. 
So the original intent of the SWAT team was to handle extraordinary and dangerous situations with, uh, you know, a specially trained force. Uh, so SWAT teams are used to conduct raids. Those raids are violent events. So wherever the SWAT teams are involved, it is not a men's affair. Uh, so the SWAT team, again, they mean business, as they always say. When we're talking about the SWAT team, we're talking about at least 20 officers that are armed with assault rifles. They have grenades, and these officers can break down doors. Um, they can use weapons such as uh, um, stun grenades or flashbang grenades. And these weapons, mind you, are designed to disorient the target and they can, they produce a loud noise and they also have a blinding flash. Again, the goal is to disorient the, 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 the target. Now, the militarization of the police started, I would say, the modern militarization of the police started under President Richard Nixon. However, President Ronald Reagan escalated uh, that, and it all started with the idea of having the war on drugs. So Congress at the time authorized uh, the, what, the the understanding known as the no-knock warrant or the no-knock raid, where police agencies, especially at the federal level, do not have to have a warrant, do not have to knock to enter a residence of a suspect. So the SWAT teams were used during drug raids for the most part. And, and that's one of the ways they became popular. But President Bush, George Bush Sr., uh, created the Department of Defense Task Forces. And the goal was to sort of link uh, soldiers and police officers for drug missions or for drug, uh, for law enforcement related to drugs. The lines between the police and the military became blurry. And the line between war and law enforcement became even much more, you know, more confusing. So it is not clear when there's a, when the police are doing war or conducting a war or when they're conducting law enforcement. And those are, those are important things to understand whenever we're talking about the relationship between the police and the military. Again, it escalated over time. Uh, nowadays, it is almost the norm. So you see police, uh, uh, dressed like military, functions like military. And in certain police departments, they do have organizational structures that mimics the military. And we've discussed in the class, there's this idea of salute and all that. All these are military uh, realities that have been imported into the police because the police, as I said before, is a civilian entity. It's, 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 uh, we've seen in previous chapters, the police are supposed to be a civilian entity. So the idea of, uh, you know, all sorts of military practices should not exist within the police. But that's not what we see in reality. But things sort of escalated since 9-11, and now we're talking about President Bush Jr. So in this case, what we saw is that the police were sort of, it wasn't so much that they, were, they used military, there was a conjunction between military and police to do certain functions. The police themselves became militarized to a point where they acted as militaries. They had military equipment. They had military authority to a certain extent. And they sort of became the, the military and, and, and their, they embodied the military, right? So in this case, they target citizens in densely populated neighborhoods. And it's just the casualties can be, I mean, the effects can be immense. Uh, but the problem is that there is usually little to no oversight over the police use of military equipment. And so that has led to, uh, you know, complaints, uh, controversies uh, amongst, uh, you know, across communities across the United States. These communities are sort of uh, uh, complaining against the use of military in uh, civilian uh, environments. But it is also important to note that in 1991, uh, Congress created a program which was known as the uh, Reutilize uh, Military Equipment. And the goal is to sort of make available certain military equipments to local police departments. And many police departments did take advantage of that, and they procured um, a number of police equipments, including, uh, you know, armored vehicle, weaponries, uh, helicopters, aircraft, and whatnot.
So about 500 police departments have vehicles that are that were built to withstand harmed piecing roadside bombs. Uh, many of these departments have used federal grants to purchase these military weaponries. And those weaponries include assault rifles, grenade launchers, even aircraft, as I alluded earlier. So, but again, there are public concerns and, and people are sort of like, we got to stop this. And the public, the pressure is to end the drug war, is to end the idea of having police heavily militarized. In other words, people are asking or demanding that police departments stop with this militarization of police. Decentralized and proactive organizations. Uh, because of the limitations of existing designs and uh, the, the need to adapt to a changing environment, uh, many police agencies are experimenting. Um, with uh, more centralized organizational structures. Um, the community policing is one of them. Uh, so there are calls to have what is known as a flatter organization. Okay, So there's a need for police organizations to grant more discretion to their police officers, to their patrol officers, right? There's a need for police entities to serve the community rather than serving uh, their own needs, right? Rather than, fo focus, rather than focusing on crime control. Again, anytime you hear the focus on crime control, what we're talking about is the militarized approach. So another option in police design is the concept known as the matrix structure. So this approach is based on, on, on multiple support systems and authority relationships. And what that means is that employees report to two superiors rather than just one. Okay. And this is somewhat a departure from, uh, you know, the militarized structure, the clear or the typical chain of command structure, right? So in this case, uh, task forces, for example, are designed to reduce the reliance on the resources of a single unit or a department. So this idea is a way to make it possible for police entities to share responsibilities, right? So each agency brings uh, to the table a different perspective, different tools, um, different expertise, uh, different strategies, and even intelligence, because there's this, this cooperation, to put it this way. And it is all within this idea of having a matrix structure. Police organization in context. Uh, the police always operate in a political arena. So in other words, you cannot do away with politics and policing. Um, they are police officers are under public scrutiny. So municipal police chiefs heads the police department. So that individual is responsible to the city manager, to the mayor, to the police commissioner and the city council. So, yeah, there is going to be politics involved. And the officer, at least the police chief, is not going to be able to perform his duties, his task at will, because he has to consider the political implications of every actions or every omission. And some of the reasons for that is that the police are dependent or dependent on those entities, right? Uh, police departments draw resources from and provide services to the communities. So, you know, they have to sort of uh, consider external factors that may affect those resources. Those external factors may be local government itself. So those entities affect the police in terms of budgets, discipline, and the benefits that they provide to the officers, right? So they have to consider these limitations uh, because, you know, they have to consider politics every move they make. Now, other agencies also affect the police. We're talking about the courts. We're talking about other police practices. So the police are not independent uh, to the extent that everything they do is based on whatever the chief wants to do or whatever the chief thinks that the organization needs. So they have to consider all those external forces that often hinder uh, the function of, of the police itself. Operations Division. Uh, whenever we're talking about operations division, the first thing that comes to mind is patrol, 
because we're talking about the backbone of policing, right? A patrol officer is all responsible for producing continuous police service. And to some degree, they have to sort of make the presence of the police known to the public. It's what is known as the, 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 the degree of vis visibility, right? So they respond to calls. They make initial contact with, with crimes, crime scene victims. Uh, they make arrests. Uh, they uh, gather evidence, they enforce traffic laws, and they complete incident reports, and at times they process a crime, although for a short period, but they do process a crime scene. So patrol officers are the largest division in a police department. Six to ten police officers are assigned patrol duties. Investigations. Uh, the Investigations Bureau is responsible for obtaining and processing evidence. They can also make arrests, but such arrests must be based on the evidence that they collected within a particular investigation, of course. So investigators do the following. They document crime scenes. They locate suspects and witnesses. They re-interview suspects and witnesses. They interrogate suspects and witnesses. They analyze records and reports. They author such warrants in many cases. They make arrests when it, when it is necessary. They prepare cases and they also testify in courts. They also conduct undercover operations. So the evidence that they collect is important because when investigators are doing their thing, the evidence they collect can be tangible. So in this case, we're talking about physical hard evidence, which was uh, collected at the crime scene or at the residence of a suspect or, or another entity. But evidence can be intangible. So in this case, we're talking about accounts from witnesses or accounts from informants. Okay. So investigators are not likely to solve crimes unless they have the cooperation of the public, unless somebody, some witness comes forward. Okay. Investigations Bureau often include a juvenile unit. And in that juvenile unit, investigate crimes or incidents related to minors, uh, people that are considered juveniles. They also are the link with schools, uh, entities, anything related to kids, uh, you know, the investigations unit or investigations bureau uh, is in charge of that. Uh, there's also the concept of chain of custody. And what that means is that uh, storage, transmission, and protection of evidence are sort of documented from the first point or the initial point and all the way to the end. So the minute the, there was a contact between a police officer with a suspect or, or a witness, there ought to be a chain of custody in terms of there ought to be a series of, of records in terms of what happened at each point during this interaction. Administrative or staff service divisions. It is important to note that these individuals are not necessarily police officers, but, but some of their functions include record keeping, uh, communication, uh, research and planning, uh, training and education, and logistics. Again, uh, there can be civilian, civilian personnel in these, in these, in these, in these groups. Organizational structures. When we are talking about organizational design and policing, the first concept that comes to mind is this idea of a functional design, right? A functional organizational design involves the creation of positions in departments within a particular police department. But this must be done based on specialized activities, right? And that involves as well identifying and consolidating common tasks in areas of work. So this functional design varies based on the size and the location of the police departments, right? And the idea here is to, sort of is to clarify responsibilities and account, account, accountability for each unit. It also limits employees' perspective within the organizational function because everything is sort of set a certain way. It is almost like the uh, mil uh, militarized structure, but you know, it's different because it is much more a functional design. It is much, the, the, the police department is based on function, not necessarily on operations, because you have to sort of make that distinction, right? Function or operation, 
right? So in this case, it is based on function. And, you know, it sort of limits employees' perspective because employees do not do not necessarily have a say. Everything has already been pre-established beforehand. So small departments do not always use that design because it is not practical for them in many cases. Uh, so many have a sort of contracted uh, specialized services with law enforcement agencies from the outside to do certain special specialties for them. For example, you may have local police departments where certain functions, certain things with certain attributions, certain things within the police departments are done elsewhere. Uh, let's say you live here in this town, but there are certain things you need, you have to go to a different town to get it done, even though those should have been done in this police department. But because of the size of the police department, they do not have those functions readily available for the citizen. Now, in larger departments, which are usually much more complex, officers may not necessarily know other officers because the function sort of puts a barrier. The, you know, the the functionality of that is the functional design puts a barrier between officers, right? So the officer within this big, huge department may not know who this officer is. For example, you say, hey, this officer is in narcotics and this officer who is in traffic may be like, well, I don't know this guy. Uh, well, even though they work in the same police department, but a particular function of that department is so sort of insulated that some officers may not even know who these people, this person is. So there's not a, a sort of a, a conviviality among these officers simply for the fact that they just don't know one another. They work at different locations or different functions. They do different things. So they don't necessarily mingle. Again, this is much more current in huge, large police departments. So in these entities, you know, tasks are specifics, right? So only one police officer may, or certain designated police officers may handle certain cases or certain specialization. Otherwise, nobody else can be involved in that. Even if you are a police officer, there are certain part of the police, the function of the police department, you cannot get involved. You cannot be there because it is not within the realm of your function. Okay? Geography. Another facet of the functional, at least the orga organizational structures of police departments is this idea of geography. And the, the concept that comes to mind here is place design. In this case, it involves establishing an organization's primary unit geographically, right? It is somewhat similar to the previous function we talked about in terms of, you know, you know, task or specific. But in this case, certain units are geographically located. So in this case, it retains a significant aspect of the functional design. For example, patrol divisions are responsible for all geographic area within a particular city limit. So the city is typically divided into beats, zones, districts, or areas. Now, in larger cities or in big cities, uh, it can be divided in uh, sectors, and those sectors may be combined to form a precinct, right? And precinct houses are distributed geographically. Each may be viewed, at least to some extent, uh, as separate departments or as a separate department, uh, but they are tied to central headquarters. Scheduling. Another facet of the organizational structures is, is scheduling. And the concept here is time design. So in this case, an organizational design involves the assigning personnel uh, on watch tours or to specific shifts, right? In this case, the patrol division may be divided into three different entities. You might have three watches, three tours, three shifts, and their goal is to provide a service during a 24-hour coverage. Although officers have traditionally been assigned to uh, eight hour shift, five days per week, and they usually have two days off, in scheduling, some departments may decide to assign officers in a 10 hour or 12 hour shift per day. Okay. Now, these variations are important because they require certain considerations, some of which include shift coverage, salary, budgets, and, and, and competence. Because again, shift coverage, you know, do we have a need for that? Do we have enough people for that? And if we do, well, we're going to have to pay them extra. So it's going to affect salary. 
And anytime you affect salary, you also affect budgets. And at the same time, are these people competent? Do are they trained for that? So there are certain considerations whenever we're looking at the police organization based on scheduling. Handling change in police organizations. Organizational changes in policing are somewhat inevitable. And the reason is that they can be brought about from diverse angles by diverse entities, right? They may be caused by both external and internal factors. Um, external factors, you could look at resources, the laws that are available. Internal factors, it could be because of personnel or the procedures that are in place. So those could lead to changes within a police organization. Now, we've talked about the paramilitary rigid structure, right? But in this particular structure, it might be much more difficult to have changes because, again, everything is sort of established uh, ahead of time, and so there's no way to sort of uh, deal with, with problems that might arise. It's important to note that changes can be accomplished smoothly if employees are involved in the decision-making, and that is why it is important to have a sort of an inclusive approach to, to, the, to the management of policing because of the fact that it is a civilian entity in nature. Because uh, when you have a police organization that is sort of, that considers the civilian facet of the entity, uh, you know, police officers tend to sort of feel much more comfortable working there. So it's much more easier to make changes, to adjust if something is not working so we can, they can find a solution rather easily. When the people feel involved, they may sort of understand the changes. They may not stop or hinder. They may not become a hindrance to the changes. They may facilitate it, right? And they may feel as though they're part of it. They're just sort of, it's necessary, right? Who is responsible for changes in the police departments? Well, it is usually the job of the police chief, right? Uh, police chief uh, serve, it is important to remember, at the pleasure of the city council, the mayor and the city manager. So again, the politics is important because police chief cannot make changes, cannot go about implementing changes or this broad, broad changes without the approval of the entities, the entities aforementioned. The same is true for police chiefs at the state and federal levels because they, they work at the pleasure of politicians at that level as well. So the average tenure for a municipal police chief is slightly more than five years. Um, sometimes it is because of health concerns, but other times it is because of stress, because of politics, uh, or personal issues related to short tenures. But in general, politics is always, is always a key player in the short tenure of a police chief. But it is also important to note that there might be some other issues, such as poor management or destabilizing problems. The chief is incapable of addressing some important problems within the police organization. So that might that might be a factor uh, in, in a premature end of a police chief's tenure. Police unions and collective bargaining. Now, it is important to note that the idea of unions in police is not a new phenomenon, okay? The history of police union dates all the way back to the 1800s. Public sector unionization has lagged uh, for at least 30 years uh, in relation to the private unionization. But it is because, you know, the government had established certain legal mechanisms which prohibit, uh, you know, certain uh, employees to engage in labor movements, right? Because they felt like these employees did not fit within the same category as, as employees in the private sector, right? So public opinion also opposed the idea that police officers or firefighters would, would engage in strikes. So the understanding is that these entities, these Public police officers and firefighters, they, they, they protect people. They protect property. So they should not be allowed to strike. So when the police do engage in strikes, the courts are always there to sort of bring, uh, to issue an injunction, uh, which would bring the strike to a halt. And, and this usually happens quickly because police officers cannot strike. At least it's hard for them to strike. Of course, they do have other strategies, which we will talk about later. Now, it is important to note that many police officers share the idea that 
police officers should not uh, stop working, should not go on strike. And they consider such actions as self-defeating. Because when police officers strike, it may lead to hostility on the part of the public, and they may also be mocked by the police chief, and other people in position of power may hold grudge against these particular police officers. So unionization of police personnel gained importance in the 1960s and all the way through the 1970s. So at that point, police officers began to demand compensation, and they wanted compensation, at least a level of compensation that was similar to what the task required. They also wanted compensation that mimicked what was happening in the private sector. Now, there are no national police officers union in the United States. However, there are uh, sort of there's a national recognition for certain entities. Uh, for example, there's a there's a widespread acceptance for entities such as Fraternal Order of Police, uh, the Police Benevolent Associations, uh, Police Officers Associations, and they do have a lot of clout when it comes to police uh, police issues, labor issues, and policing. And this is true, particularly when it comes to collective bargaining. Now, most state and local governments engage in collective bargaining with police officers. They engage in negotiations to determine conditions of employment, generally. Although such negotiations um, affect a substantial portion of state and local budgets, they occur uh, away from the public view. So they always do it in sort of, it's like in a closed chamber and a closed room. Now, if collective bargaining does not lead to an agreement, police officers occasionally use job actions, which usually involve the notion known as blue flu, uh, work slowdown, or work speed up. Now, when we talk about the blue flu, police officers call in sick in mass. Uh, work slowdown, they don't enforce the law as much as they should. Or work speed ups, they enforce the law too, too much like little things, so they just, they, 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 they clog the system by enforcing every little law uh, in the books for the most part. Uh, collective bargaining usually comes in the form of a contract, and that contract covers uh, specific areas for the employer. It also covers employee relations, and the contract binds both parties legally during a specific period. Police unions and professionalism. Collective bargaining typically results in highly formalized rules. Uh, it indicates the rights and the obligations of both parties. Uh, the formal nature of such rules uh, make them very rigid, or extremely rigid sometimes. Now, the principle here is what is known as rewards is based on merit. It is often sort of uh, compromised in the process of unionization. So in this case, those who perform the best can be rewarded no more than those who perform at a very minimum level. Of course, this is going to create problems, often does create problems, uh, growing uh, disagreements and, you know, resentments because this guy didn't work as much as I did and he gets the same money that I receive or the same benefit that I receive. So it's always a source of problems within certain police departments, but it is important to understand that this is the foundation of the concept of, of unionization. But critics argue that this is a way to promote mediocrity, right? Because no matter how bad, no matter how incompetent a police officer is, it might be very difficult to fire that officer from the force. In fact, it is almost impossible to fire a police officer these days unless there's a blatant evidence that something is wrong. And even then, there are possibilities for the officer uh, to go back and to come back into the force at a later date. So, uh, you know, a lot of people think that the unionization is, is not a good thing for the profession itself, but that in and of itself is a different debate which we could have in, uh, another time. There are also other downsides to consider, right? Uh, union representatives may not really act as police officers anymore, so they may view their union position as more important than their position as police officers, you see. And the, the opposite is also true. So police administrators, for instance, may view union representatives as adversaries rather than employees, you see. So it creates a sort of fictions, if you will. It creates friction within the police department. But now, it doesn't have to be that way. 
Okay. So, you know, sometimes, you know, police entities find a good way to compromise uh, because there are benefits to unionization. So it is not all bad. Police professionalism. The concept of professionalism in policing involves, uh, at least it, it entails the idea that somebody or some entity belongs to a profession, right? So the person has achieved a level of mastery and a specialized knowledge of a particular task or or, or vocation or whatnot, right? So that individual is also expected to behave in ways that are consistent with certain established professional standards. So anytime we're talking about professionalism, that's what we're talking about. First, there is a profession, you belong to it. Second, there's a level of mastery of certain skills, certain specialty that you sort of have mastered that, but you're also expected to behave according to certain professional standards, right? So a profession usually requires some form of accreditation, right? Some certification or some sort of a licensing process. Because you have to have a particular credential that says, okay, you are a professional, you are certified, you are licensed to do this, that, that, and that, okay? But there's also the idea that every professional must adhere to a code of ethics, okay? So this is a way of holding members of that profession accountable when they misbehave. So professionalism became the goal of policing during the reform era. But police officers have limited discretion and autonomy. But the problem is that this is important for professionalism. So most police officers do not have the leeway to determine certain facets of their profession. Professional literature and research. Now, there is a growing body of professional literature in policing. They range from periodicals, academic research, and government reports. So if you want to know about policing, if you want to find out about the police, there are ways to find out about the profession. Code of Ethics. This is an important element of the police profession. There ought to be a way to hold uh, the members of the profession accountable. And the code, the code of Ethics does just that. And the idea was developed by the International Association of Chief of Police. Uh, it was a way to sort of establish a specific mo uh, code of conduct for police officers. Now, it is in effect in most police departments across the country. So, uh, you know, pro police officers are supposed to abide by a certain code of ethics. Professional associations. Now, we've talked about these before, but there are several professional police associations. Now, many of them are specifically tailored for police chiefs or executive officers, but there are other organizations that are much more for mainstream police officers, right? For example, you have the Fraternal Order of Police. This one is oriented much more towards rank and file police officers. So they also serve as a sort of a, a social control organization, to, be, to, to put it this way. Self-improvement. Uh, basically, there are no national minimum uh, standards um, that police departments or police personnel must adhere to in terms of self-improvement, right? So some departments uh, encourage accreditation. Others promote rank-and-file structures. So there's not one way of doing policing, as I said before. And this is, again, the reason the profession is dynamic. It's complex because it is very, even though there are certain standards, there are certain ways that have sort of been established, but police departments are under no obligation to adhere to those standards to some, to that, uh, to a certain degree. So self-improvement is usually the key for many police departments or for many police officers. Academic field. Um, there are hundreds of college-level academic programs uh, that are designed for policing. Uh, there are those who are, that are centered on criminal justice. Uh, the one that you are in right now, this course that you're taking right now, it's within this purview. So those programs, those, those courses or those uh, uh, academic fields are designed to sort of, you know, to give you a sense of how the police work in general 
the how the police work in general and, and how to be a police officer, right? Because a lot of things about the police you're not going to find out in the police academy. In the police academy, you're go, you're going to learn a certain facet of the function in terms of the 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 hands-on approach to policing, the, you know, the patrol, um, you know, the, the, the shootings and all that, but they're not going to tell you when to engage in those things and how effective a patrol can be. You know, all that are sort of relegated to academicians, scholars, to sort of give you a sense of the effect of having patrols, the effects of, of implementing a particular procedure or, or program against crime. So those are things you're going to need in, in academia. And this is why there are a wide range of programs at the college level, university level, that sort of teaches you that gives you a sense of how to be a police or how police work. So, but again, there are no mandates in most agencies for police to attain a high level of education. To be a police officer, in many cases, a high school education, that is all you need. But again, it is encouraged for you to have much more information, to have much more knowledge. And as we will see in the next uh, in chapter, it is important because this is a way for you to sort of climb the ladder to, to reach a higher level, a higher level within the profession. Accreditation, we have talked about this before. The Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agency, also known as CALEA, was established in the 1970s, particularly in 1979. And the goal was to sort of create development of standards which articulate a clear statement of professional objectives. In other words, the police is policing is supposed to be a certain way. So the accreditation is designed to sort of reinforce that goal, that objective, right? Uh, the commission developed a voluntary accreditation process. Again, like I said, no police entities are obligated to be accredited, active accreditation. But law enforcement agencies are evaluated when they seek accreditation in terms of the defined standards, right? So the current edition of the process includes 400 standards, uh, and those standards are sort of uh, covered uh, in nine law enforcement areas. But just to clarify, they have six specific goals, and those goals entail uh, strengthen crime prevention and control uh, capabilities, formalize essential management procedures, establish fair and um, non-discriminatory personal pract personnel practice, uh, improve ser service delivery, uh, solidify uh, interagency cooperation and co coordination, uh, increase community and staff confidence in the agency. Of course, many of these goals are chimerical in nature. Nonetheless, those are the sort of the key goals that the accreditation process, uh, you know, would sort of expect police officers or police departments to sort of uh, be able to prove that they can do. Okay, to remain accredited, agencies must maintain compliance with these applicable standards. Now, that's all for this chapter. See you in the next chapter.